Hey everyone, it's me, Coral. Welcome back. Today I'm doing something I have been so excited about. I've kind of been planning it for a while. It requires extra reading on my part, so it's not something I'm gonna be able to do every month because otherwise I would have to dedicate everything I read basically into doing this and I just I like to read other things too so um I am going to be talking about horror tropes or elements in horror books or kinds of characters we see often and stuff like that and I'm so excited this is my first one and I have decided to dedicate this to demons. <laughs> so I'm just going to talk about only a couple horror books that I've read that talk about demons. So yeah, there are tons out there. I cannot possibly read all of them. And some of these, well, one of them, I didn't necessarily like, but I decided to include it anyways. So you I don't know, so I have kind of a more well-rounded video, I guess. I don't know. Anyways, that's enough. The first book I'd love to talk about today is Ararat by Christopher Golden. This was published in 2017, so it's pretty recent. And there are a lot of elements to this book. I talked about it once in a survival horror video where I talked about some of my favorite survival horror books and this the survival horror aspect is only part of it really what this is is a book about people trapped in a place with a demon which is just great it's great to read about I love books like that um kind of the like isolation horror so this is about a group of I'm not sure if I would call them exactly explorers. They're kind of like that. It's a husband and wife couple. They write kind of like travel books, I think. Oh no. <laughs> um, it's been a couple months since I read this. Excuse me. I, I don't think it's a TV show. I think it's, I think that they write travel books. So they get a tip about a cave that's been discovered on Mount Ararat. And they're like, we have to be the first people in this cave. We have to be, we have to be the first, like, people who are not just scientists or archaeologists. We want to be the first people to, like, document and release to the public, like, what is in this cave. It, it, and it's, it's treacherous. Like, they have a really hard time finding guides to take them up. The mountain because it's winter and an avalanche is what uncovered the cave in the first place so it's treacherous and it's dangerous and it's cold and oh my god this is one of the things that i love most about horror is when it gets super realistic and i think that's why i like survival horror specifically so much because it's like, man, I could get lost in the woods tomorrow. I could, for some reason, be climbing up a mountain and, I don't know, find a Yeti. I don't know. Just kidding. Um, anyways, <laughs> God, I'm just so, I'm so excited about doing this video and I'm rambling. But they eventually find some Sherpas to guide them up the mountain and they discover... I mean, they don't discover it. There's already some scientists there, but they're the first like civilians kind of to be able to see what's in this cave. And they get up there and things are ooky spooky. Like it just feels bad in that cave and they don't really know why. There's this, I'm gonna try to leave out spoilers, which I'm not super good about, but there's an artifact in there. Is that in the... Oh, it's in the synopsis, so I'm going to include it. Uh, there is what people think is remnants of Noah's Ark. So that's like a big deal. That's a big deal for everybody, whether you're an atheist or a Christian or you're a Jew. Like, that's a big, crazy deal if Noah's Ark were to be discovered. So 
Um, that's another dynamic that this couple has is that the wife is an atheist. So this is also kind of like a test in her like unfaith, like kind of, I don't know how, I don't know. Um, so that, that part was really interesting and oh my god they get up to this cave it's all gloomy doomy it feels bad it, it feels like like this pressure like this bad pressure on everybody and people are they're quick to anger they're just not really having a good time up there but they're like stuck in this cave now because it's too snowy there's blizzards it, it, they just can't cannot safely leave at this point. So once they get up there, they're there until the weather clears up. And deep in the bowels of this um, ship in the mountain, in this cave, uh, they find they find some bodies of who they believe to be, you know, whoever would have been in this ark, Noah, his wife, I don't know. Um, and they also find this like sarcophagus type of thing and it's like sealed shut so they're like huh what would be in there that like they don't want out so badly or they don't want to have access to so badly and um they f eventually get it open and it's another body a skeleton kind of like a mummified skeleton but it has horns it's like human but it has horns and so they're like fuck <laughs> is this a demon and that's where I will end my summary of this book. But I will tell you that I th this had that great thing in survival horror where the people start, the people in the group start to not trust each other and some bad things are going on and they don't know who's doing them and they don't know if it's something about this demon that they found or if it's something from their crew. There's a lot of different um, groups of people in this cave too, which makes it, um, I don't know, makes it easier to gang up on others because they're already kind of segregated. You know, there's like the archeologists, there are the Sherpas who've brought them up to this mountain. There are, you know, um, there's a Catholic priest who's come to look at this and stuff like that. So that gets really angsty. There's a lot of tension between these groups of people. And I mean, eventually it's like every man for himself kind of. So it gets good, it gets really tense. And there's this part in the end that is pretty gruesome and gory and it was so well written. Um, I think the one thing I would have to say about this is that there was some parts in the middle that was like kind of tedious and I just wanted to get to some action. But other than that, this was really good. And I would definitely recommend this, especially if you like books about weird artifacts getting discovered or if you like books about mountaineering or survival horror this is for you the next book i would love to tell you about is one that i read very recently my best friend's exorcism by grady hendrix hold on my cat's doing something okay i'm back um my best friend's exorcism by grady hendrix i loved this book Ugh, there's so much. I didn't even grow up in the 80s. I was born in the very early 90s and like I still feel nostalgic for the 80s reading this even though I was not even, I didn't even exist then. But um, this is about, this takes place in the 80s and it's about two girls named Abby and Gretchen who are the best of friends. And while out one night, they take some LSD and this is the first time they've really done drugs like they're good kids they get good grades and so they take this LSD and Gretchen gets lost for like all night and eventually Abby finds her but Gretchen's like weird but she can't tell them like where she's been 
what she's done for hours and hours and hours. This is like literally all night she's gone and she just doesn't know where, I don't know, she has no explanation. She doesn't know what to tell him. And things just get w worse and worse with Gretchen. Like she's acting out at school kind of. She like stops showering or changing her clothes. And Abby is very concerned but she doesn't know what to do about it. Um, she's only she's only like a 16 year old girl. She doesn't know whether she should talk to parents. Like she doesn't know. She doesn't know what's wrong with Gretchen. You know, coming forward and asking for help would also mean it's t telling people that they did acid and she's kind of, you know, reluctant to do that. And, hmm. I think that's where I'm going to stop with the summary of this one as well. So many parts of this book were good. I think Grady Hendrick's writing is just so captivating and he's humorous and it's not even like, it's not like, I don't know, I wouldn't even consider this like a comedic horror book. It's just that he's, he, I don't know, he's, he does it somehow. It's like funny. And, but he's not being a clown. I don't know. Does that make any sense? It's not even like subtle necessarily. It's just that he's like snarky and cheeky and it comes out in his writing somehow, I guess. And these characters were so good. And the end was so good. And I just loved every page of this book. I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. I loved it so much. I think everybody should read it. The next book... I want to tell you about is The Sentinel by Jeffrey Convitz. This was published in 1974, so this is quite older. This is over 45 years old by now. Almost as old as my mom. Don't tell her I said that. But this came out on the coattails of The Exorcist. I think it was kind of trying kind of to like ride that wave of being scared about Satan, you know? This was even before the satanic panic. So like, this just has no excuse except for that. Um, and let me just say that this book wasn't very good. I went into it with very high hopes. For some reason, I had mistakenly thought that this was kind of a classic of the horror genre. And I've come to find out since then that it's not. And I'm not the only person who didn't like this. Uh, but I felt like I, I, but I wanted to tell you guys about it because it fits into this theme. And because I like having, I don't know, I, I, I don't only want to gush about what I like, I guess. Sometimes I like to rant about what I don't like. So here this is. In this video, I'm going to talk about it. So... The Sentinel is about a model. Of course she's a model. She's in New York City. Um, what is her name? I can't even remember. That's how little I give a shit. I feel like it was like, oh, Allison. I was gonna say Amanda or something. Allison. She's a model in New York City, of course. But she has a haunted past. But we don't know what that is. But it's haunting her. And she has this boyfriend also who seems like he must be much older than her because she's like 26 and he's like a lawyer, like a well-known lawyer at this point. So like, I can't imagine that he's a well-known 26 year old lawyer, but okay. So, um, I was also really confused about, cause they keep talking about like how she left home and she came back to home and all this stuff and like, her father died, so she, I thought she was coming back home, but her boyfriend was living there and like it made it seem like she was gone away from home for a long time. So I'm not sure how their relationship would have been like that. Cause it seemed like she had been with, I don't know. I was confused about that part, but in the book at least, this tells me that she's coming back home for her father's funeral and she decides then that her father's dead, so she might as well live here now. I think, I don't know. Um, I was very, as you can see with my face, I was very confused about that part. So she is looking to rent 
And she's like in an apartment and she finds this beautiful old brownstone with a room for rent. Uh, so she eventually is able to rent it. Um, the realtors kind of, she was saying like, oh, I didn't realize that the owner had put an ad out again. It, he, he stopped, he stopped putting out ads a while ago. So I didn't re even realize that he was running ads for a room for rent anymore. And Allison moves in and, um, she is kind of insufferable. So is her boyfriend, Michael. They're both insufferable. I wanted to strangle them both, but I'm not strong enough to do that. Also, they're fictional characters. Anyways, Allison like starts meeting her neighbors. She meets this nice old man who has a parakeet and a just a fucking cat that he walks around with everywhere. A black and white cat named Jezebel. And it's kind of kooky. She also meets some other tenants who are Swedish lesbians and she's very offended by this and there's a lot of like pearl clutching they call them dykes a lot and it's just crazy um one of the women tries to come on to her I guess and when she is upset about that the other one like beats her up so it's very much like the Mm, that thing where it's like gay people cannot control themselves and so they're just gonna try to come on to you even if you say no and even if you're straight kind of a thing which is obviously not how real life is and so <laughs> there's some of that so Allison meets her neighbors they're all weird and kooky and um she starts hearing like noises in the apartment above her. She finds out that there's nobody living up there. She's also having these like fainting spells and like these migraines and yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't know how much of this I should tell you about because you might want to read it even though it was not very good. It was kind of humorous. It's pretty goofy. It's pretty goofy. Um, I guess I want to tell you about the ending. So if I'm going, I'm going to talk about spoilers right now. So if you just want to fast forward a little bit, I'll hold this book up again to signify that I'm done, okay? So Allison finds out that there's no neighbors. She is imagining these neighbors. And also there's an old priest who lives up in like the very top of the brownstone and he just stares out the window, but he's blind. So they're like, what in the world? And eventually it turns out that the old man is the sentinel and he is, the house is built on like an access point from hell or something like that. So he's like keeping hell away from the earth and she is going to be the next sentinel. Dun dun dun. And that is The Sentinel by Jeffrey Convitz. I don't know if this will be worth your time. It might be. It's weird. I don't know. The step back art is interesting. There's also a movie um, adaption of this, which I haven't watched, so maybe I should do that. I've heard that it's kind of spooky, so. All right, now to lighten up the mood, I'm going to talk about a book that I loved. In fact, it's been probably like a year and a half probably since I read it, and I think I might need to reread it because I liked it so much. That is The Wicked by James Newman. Um, this one was published in 2017, so this is fairly recent as well. The Wicked. It has this like totally 80s vibe. I mean, if you can't tell by the cover even, like it has kind of a distressed, it has this fake thrift store sticker on it kind of a thing. And it definitely feels 80s in the writing too. Um, it's, it has that like small town with a secret vibe going on. And this is about a family who moves into this small town. Um, the father does artwork for paperback books, which is cool. And it's just like an extra little fun thing in there. And um, yeah, small town with a secret. So like these weird things keep happening 
and it turns out it's this demon called Moloch and he's like trying to like get the souls of the people who live in this town and like children and stuff like that and uh, I don't know there's a lot of really good gross out parts in this um there's like this part with like these creepy like insect kids that like sting this person to death and I don't know it's um I don't I don't even want to tell you too much about this because this is a short enough book to where like I feel like most of what happens in here is important to know for the story and so it might take something away if I tell you too much about it but I thought that this was really good. It really does like, the, it really captures like the small town feel like there's this really gossipy old woman who just like sits and talks on her phone all day and gossips and gossips and just stuff like that. It really made it feel real. It made these characters feel real, even the minor characters. So um, this is The Wicked by James Newman. I think that James, I don't know him really personally, but I've interacted with him on social media and he is such a, he might be the nicest guy out there. Um, and that always makes me want to buy more of an author's books when they're so personable and engaging. Um, so I really think that you guys should give this a try. Not just because James is nice, but also because it's a good book. I have another one of his books on my shelf that I've been meaning to get to and I haven't and I need to fix that. But I feel like this video is getting a little bit too long. Anyways, these are four books that share a trope, a horror trope, which is demons and possession and guarding the gates to hell. I don't know. Um, anyways, thank you so, so much for watching everybody. Let me know if there's any tropes that you love, um, any tropes that you'd like me to kind of dig into, any horror books that you think I should read that have to do with demons or possessions. Yeah, just let me know. Talk to me in the comments. I'd love to hear from you. I have links down below to my some of my social media if you'd like to follow me on there. But I think that's it. That's all I have for you. Please stop asking for more. Just kidding. I love to give you more. This is the end of my video. I w I'm excited about this video. I'm excited to go edit this and get this up ASAP. So anyways, thank you for again for watching. I'm finally done talking. I will see you later, alligators!